Welcome to your favorite show. We're here. It's us. Browner, Lawhead, Browner, Lawhead, John Browner, Jason Lawhead, joining you from Southern California, San Diego, Los Angeles, Mega Market is what we're referring it to. You're listening on the Mightier 1090, or you're listening via podcast through iTunes or Google Play, or you're watching our lovely faces on YouTube under Kaplan and crew as well. What's up, Jason? What up? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. How about those Browns, baby? You know what? You, you, I love your last name even more today. I mean, this <laughs> game was the one that made me just breathe a big sigh of relief at this point in the season, man. I know your Bears are spinning a little bit, but they play tonight. Hopefully, go Bears. Beat them Steelers. They're just kicking off. But, um, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, I feel good, obviously. After all the, do you, do you feel lighter? Do you feel like you took a you took a dump this weekend? I swear, I do. I feel like I just got like a, an AIDS test back negative. You know, I've been waiting for like a week. You know, like you're waiting for that whole week. Like, oh my god, are they ever gonna call? What's going on? <laughs> ah, don't worry about it, Mister Law. Everything's gonna be fine. Oh, thank you, thank you. If they don't call, is that good news? If they don't call, is that bad news? Something yeah, right. Yeah, so man, yeah, so a uh, bit of cloud nine after that big Browns win with all the stuff obviously we talked about last week going into this whole thing, and you know, we can touch on that later, but yeah, feeling good. How are you, you know, feeling? feeling? How's your how was your weekend? My my weekend was interesting, man. I spent a lot of it just kind of hanging, watching games, and uh, uh, spent a little bit of time with my kid and went to dinner and watched her completely destroy a restaurant by herself like a small tornado that's great, that's great. how old how old is she now she's a two about to be three in a couple of months oh, yeah if, that's to, if that's you tornado ever, age yeah if you ever go to eat in ob they just let dogs walk around the restaurant <laughs> just ocean beach i love you you guys are different you're a different breed hey, but if there's a two-year-old in the restaurant man at least your dog well, please well i was a I was a restaurant manager for a long time. Uh, you know, in my place back in Cleveland when I was doing all kinds of things before I started doing stand up. And yeah, man, when when a when a family walks in with like that two to three year old that's like too small to know better, but big enough to just right. bundle around like a drunk dude in a bar, you're just like, oh God, <laughs> there's gonna be vacuum cleaner bags full of crackers after this and just whatever it is. It looks like you, you can have like one two-year-old at a party of four, and after they leave, it looks like Mardi Gras took place in <laughs> like a Bourbon Street the, in February, bro. The best explanation for a two-year-old at a dinner is drunk person who like you got to get him out at this point. <laughs> exactly. All right, know. all right, we babies don't know what too much to is. drink. Let's get her. Right. Yeah, exactly. We don't know who that person came with, but we've got to get them out of here now. Throw that two-year-old in an Uber and get him out of here. <laughs> She's throwing rice everywhere. She's spilling drinks. And it's, she's pulling all the napkins out. She's sprinkling oh, yeah. salt and pepper everywhere. And it's like, listen, man, she understands or no. But again, she's two. So just give us our own space. She'll mm -hmm. stop feeding the random dog whatever's on our table. And we can go about our <laughs> merry way. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But, but you you're making memories, ridiculous. man. Lasting memories. Yes. Yes. I can't wait to she has a two-year-old and they destroy a place. Yeah, It'll be exactly. fantastic. One of the things that happened over this weekend, it's funny you asked me that, was that a lot of sports things happen. Sometimes we have this show, and we are grateful to to see something happen. You go, oh, God, I can't wait till tomorrow. <laughs> when this Aaron Rodgers news broke, I had nowhere to go. Because we were off on Kaplan for Friday. Obviously, we do this show till Wednesday. I had nowhere to go with my pent-up rage. And I got to tell you, man, F Aaron Rodgers. And this is not even from a football standpoint. This is from a dude standpoint now. Like, I'm all for the vaccine. I know you are exhausted on the conversation. By the way, I am too. Yeah. I don't want to talk about this. I hate this topic. I really feel like it's a it's a divider like we've never seen a divider before. But you you can respect dudes who tell the truth. Cole Beasley told you he wasn't taking it. Carson Wentz told you he wasn't taking it. Um, uh, 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 Cousins, Kirk Cousins told you he wasn't taking it. And it, it, was a, it was news for a day, and then you went on talking about something else. The Aaron Rodgers situation shows you why his family doesn't like the guy. Like, he's a coward. 
he's a coward. I get when people say, oh, he doesn't want to be disliked. That's cool, too. But you get if you are your own person, if you march to the beat of your own drum, like he professed in the interview that he did when all this came out, when he so he gets his advice from Joe Rogan, Doctor Joe Rogan, I'm assuming we're calling him now. You're a coward, bro. You're a coward. Just say you don't want to take the shot because you don't know what's in it. Don't say because Johnson and Johnson was caught in blood clots because again that was like four people out of three million. Like, just say you didn't want to take the shot, bro. Because when you went to the NFL doctors that you, you admitted, they called you a coop. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. What, I don't know what does he expect for people to do now? Because now he looks like a liar. He looks completely disingenuous. And then saying that the, the woke mob is after him. Again, a woke mob is not a thing. Stop calling it that. If you lie about a public subject. It found out that you did lie about said public subject. People are going to come after you. That's not the woke mob. It's called decency. It's called being honest. And you were neither. You were neither, bro. Yeah, I, I feel like it's almost, uh, you know, the woke mob, the whole, um, he sets a, he sets now, he's trying to set a, he's trying to take it out over here. Uh, because he was caught lying and then lying and then lying again about why he was lying. So the woke, the woke mob is a let me get people on my side comment. Let, let me get the people that get hooked on the woke mob, which is like the woke mob is what you're right. The woke mob is like one cubicle in every 10 office buildings. So right. or, or like or, or, or like or two people share a cubicle at Netflix that have the same opinion, and then they get three people in the lunchroom to, you know, right. I mean, that's the woke mob at the end of the day. There isn't really this mob of woke people going through the streets um, in, in in these kind of circumstances. But, you know, he had to, he had to kind of um, put certain, start like a fire over here so you didn't see this fire over here type of thing. Um, and I, at some point, I even think like he was even starting to troll on purpose in a way. I almost think he was like, well, if they're going to come down on me, I'm just going to be snarky Aaron Rodgers that I've been. He's like Aaron Rodgers is like if Jackson Mahomes had all the talent in the family and he was the quarterback. <laughs> He's like, uh, like, you know what I mean? Like that. Oh, God. That was Aaron so Rodgers bad. Is. Um, but I mean, I don't. He was always the kind of guy that was always to me on the surface of just everything I've seen and just the way he walks the walk uh, in his career. It didn't surprise me, um, you know, well, the, I, the not being back, the not even lying about it. Now that we know it's just an interesting chain of events more than anything on how it's right. all going down with way the way he kind of put things out there last year as kind of wanting out for the reasons he wanted out. And then, you know, the turmoil coming in as a reigning MVP, but then he kind of, he gets the ship right at early and he's always just kind of been that um, I'm the biggest player on this team. And I always will be. You drafted me to replace Brett Favre. Remember that you came to get me to get him right. out of here. And I think that's where, he is and he's always been and you know obviously based off the success of his career in green bay that's only inflated that ego part more and more every year as he's gone on so uh, i'm not surprised at all i thought one of the telling signs of all of this was that i wasn't shocked when he started talking in that manner in an interview in which he started talking i've always felt like he was let me back up Tad, when the information came out about his family and how he treated his family, at that point, I knew there was something more to him that was very douchey. Again, I don't, I don't dislike holistic people. I think there's a large part of uh, uh, American medicine and a medical field that can be treated without using chemotherapy, without using Vicodin, without using a lot of sure. these drugs that are getting people more addicted than it is actually helping people. So I'm like, I think you should smoke a joint before you pound three Vicodin. But again, I'm not the type of person who's warped by the medical medicine part of America. 
I'm an open person. I'm an open-minded person. I'm a free. I would consider myself a free thinker. I don't make my decisions on something before I hear the, the facts about it. But what I can tell you is, it's pretty much decided on this: what helps and what doesn't help. Because all the people who are going, because when Terry Bradshaw goes, you're taking a horse dewormer. It is what it is, folks. And now people are going after Terry Bradshaw, going, no, it's not. Like, listen, man, you want to learn about money in America? If Ivermectin, which I wish I never knew the name of this. this product. If Ivermectin helped with COVID, they would go to the FDA so fast, your head would spin because you know how much money they would be making. Ivermectin would be the, the on the stock market, it would be the highest stock you could find overnight if it did right. help. Yeah, there'd be there'd be there'd already be uh, urgent care clinics inside of barns built already by now all over America, dude. You'd be going. Delmar into, would have a line around the corner. <laughs> exactly, Delmar Racetrack would be in an emer just a, a triage unit right now, right? Right. Like, um, It'd be yeah. Getting, I mean, I've remembered them pot in their mouth in, in 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 North County. Yeah, I mean, and he's now he's just elongated this story for himself when he could have maybe just just could have got out of it even by saying hey look you know i'm I misled i just said or or even you don't even have to like blame yourself in a way you don't even have to apologize and, and you just have to just go you know maybe uh you know i, I cho chose my words wrong a, a, in those interviews i i i'm i'm hesitant i'm healthy i want to see yes. how i react to all this kind of stuff and yeah you know like you said at least some of these other guys like you said had a narrative they had a reason they came out and they were firm on why they weren't going to do this right now and and a lot of them cited what i just kind of said in in different kind of words and definitions but it was mainly hey uh and, and we talked earlier i think in some episodes when we talked about Kyrie, i even said i was hesitant for a while i i waited until uh end of may or june to just to see what what people were doing I, my parents were getting it because they were old first and some other people i was just like hey I'm a healthy guy. I'm eating plant based. You know, I I I, I rap. Right. I, I, I I'm gonna wait, man. I I, I want to see. You know, but yeah, it seems like you're right. It's divided us more than anything I can ever remember. And it's like we went from Operation Warp Speed to Operation Warp Brain in this whole thing, man. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just crazy. And now it's in our everyday life and sports and entertainment and everything that we escape the politicized world for. It's just sitting in its lap. I, I I think uh, there's people who need to answer questions about this that are not named Aaron Rodgers. So whoever operates the Packers health and safety program, I want to hear from you because he was on the sideline without a mask when he was supposed to because he's not vaccinated and he was in a room with reporters who could have health conditions or have families or kids with health conditions that he was in close contact with not wearing the mask all season long. So the Packers have to answer questions. If I'm the NFL, I levy a fat fine on the Packers. And if I'm the NFL, I levy a fat fine on Aaron Rodgers for lying. I don't think he should be suspended because as egregious as I think it is, the Packers knew about this. It wasn't like he snuck and did behind the Packers back. They were well aware. He met with the NFL. They told mm -hmm. him no. The Packers knew that the NFL told him no. You, we don't consider you vaccinated. But yet they let him carry on like a vaccinated player. The NFL didn't do that. The Packers did that. So I want to hear from Ted oh, Ted Thompson. I don't even know if he's even the, the uh, managing operator over there anymore. Whoever the general manager is now, because I know it's not Ted Thompson, it's somebody else. Whoever that person is, they should have been in front of a microphone the second that interview ended, going, all right, I'll answer all questions. Yeah, yeah, we knew. Whoops. Well, we apologize. Or we didn't know. He misled us, too. But they won't do that. They'll bite the bullet because it's Aaron Rodgers because he already caused enough stink in the organization. As so I want to because last year the NFL came down hard on the Denver Broncos for their entire room, the quarterback room, catching COVID. They made a guy play quarterback who was selling insurance literally two days before. Yeah. yeah. So I want to see what they do. I want to see what they do. 
Yeah, because, you know, what's deep down in that fine print of in the protocol, right? That protocol that they came out with, with all these things like, yes. what's, you know, so violating the mask, bringing it around teammates or reporters or people that work in the locker room, the people that are employees in the tunnel and in the areas where where Rogers walks by after he parks his car and all those other people and all those other things like deep down. What is that like protocol? Is there a punishment? Is there specific things that? They have to try to either explain, make make Aaron Rodgers an example of, or it's just like saying, well, we really never, we just said it to say it. You know, right. we just said it to say it, and then it's kind of biting us uh, in the butt on public opinion right now. But something will happen in the news cycle, and this will wear off, Will. Whether they do anything about it, they don't do anything about it, they investigate, they punish, they, they, they keep, they'll keep testing him maybe. I think the furthest they'll go is to say, hey, man, you tested positive again. Now it's two straight games. And maybe that will be their, look, this is what we're doing. Well, we're testing him. Now he's negative. He can play whatever. But I don't think you'll see. I think if, if it gets kicked around more, you'll start seeing. The NFL will probably be like, hey, let's start bringing some of those emails back out. Let's start the, you know, you know what I mean? Like, let's all change fails, the story here. When all those spells, wait for the Raiders to do something stupid. Because now they got a, a draft from 2020 on the on the internet with guns saying he's going to kill people. So now that's the topic now, and people aren't discussing this. But sure. there's another thing that surrounded this game because the Packers, the Chiefs nailed terrible. The Chiefs looked terrible. The Chiefs were able to pull it. This idea that... Jordan Love could learn from watching Aaron Rodgers. If you're if, if you're in the camp, and I this is not this is separate from the Aaron Rodgers conversation, but this is something that annoys me. If you have a rookie quarterback that you think can play, you don't play him. He sits and watches. He gets out there and he does what Jordan Love does. It completely blows up the argument because all we heard was Justin Fields didn't play. He should watch and learn. Trevor Lawrence. Well, he couldn't watch and learn. Zach Wilson should watch and learn. Matt Jones should watch and learn. All those guys are playing, and they're getting better every week. They're all better than Jordan Love, who's been in the NFL for a year and a half. Trey Lance may be the only one still on the same level as him, but he hasn't played. So the idea that forcing these guys to watch while they learn, the Aaron Rodgers situation has absolutely exposed that because Love didn't ready to play the NFL game. Well, yeah, and it's uh, you know, he he's not taking snaps obviously in in many practices. I mean, he's not getting many reps in this last year and a half as Rodgers' uh MVP season and uh that's a tough one to go into. I don't care if the chief defense has been bad all year. They've got oh man, you're looking at like what do we need right now? We need a Packer offense that doesn't have some weapons and has their, you know, MVP quarterback shelf um and they got to come into arrowhead and all that kind of stuff and uh so this was and you're right and the sad part is is the chiefs stunk it up they stunk it's it up the they, they, they played their two worst games probably under andy Reid in the last two weeks and they've somehow won because they were fortunate enough to get the giants and they were fortunate and enough to get this Packers Packers. team in this situation and so now they're five and four, and it's almost like you know they're just playing with some house money right now uh, to try to get to try to improve. But um, you know I, I, that kid was in a rough situation with the media scrutiny around the whole team and the environment, and yeah. the fact that he was not welcomed by Aaron Rodgers. He was the source of all the the headaches last year um, mm -hmm. with Rodgers coming into this year. And now he's got to be tasked with, hey, go go out and beat the two-time AFC champions, even though they're not playing very well. That's still a really tough task to come out and try to perform under those circumstances. So I feel bad for the kid. I feel bad that that was the first way he was put in because that kid should be getting more of the fourth quarter snaps when games are blowouts over right. that time until it's time for him to take over or maybe a, a Rodgers gets knocked out of a game and, and hurt and you're said, hey, kid, this is why you're here. But um, he knew he had to start. Here is why. Here is every why. Yeah. I want to tell you, Jordan Love has failed in every sense of learning something in the NFL. If you're listening to the show, have you ever said that the top, top of the top, top, top of the stadium, there are seats at Pickle Park that are so high, 
feel like you're outside. We're posting a picture right now on the show, and if you want to see this picture, head over to YouTube, Kaplan and Crew, uh, Brown and Lawhead. Renee Stone, Jordan Love's girlfriend, and Anna Love, his mother, are sitting so high up in the stadium, they might as well not be in it. Listen, <laughs> I, I don't know what to, what to make of that, but you've got... You've learned nothing, young man. You've learned absolutely nothing about the NFL if that's where your mother and your girlfriend are sitting. God. Do Bob Euchre's seats weren't that bad in a Miller Lite commercial where they were making fun of the worst seats in the house? He was actually doing that old Miller Lite. Like when they kick him out of the front row, yeah. his seats were actually the row under the last row in that upper deck. I mean, that's how – and that was a comedy commercial. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just like – no, uh, they, they did everything to those people except have Jackson Mahomes come up there and pour a bottle of water on her head. And then do a dance. Like, <laughs> yeah, bruh, put him on a TikTok seat video. It's, yeah, see, you know. there are like 50, there are like 50 different places where you can get better seats than that. Jordan Love, man, please do better on so many levels. Or don't. You're a Packers quarterback. I'm a Bears fan. Go to hell. When we come back, Brown and Lawhead will go around the league over the weekend. Brown and Lawhead, we'll be back. Browner and Law head back from the second half of the show on the Mighty 1090 YouTube, the podcast store. If you're just tuning into the show, we had an interesting conversation about Aaron Rodgers. By the way, we didn't get to the funniest part of it, and I got so mixed up in my anchor that I didn't <laughs> even share it. Uh, I'm here with Jason Law. Hey, Jason, what's up, brother? Hey, man, we're just having another good show. It's Monday. I, this is the first time in my life I've ever loved Mondays is working with you, dude. So. That's right. Well, that's good. Right. I want to Howard Stern, who has been blasting COVID people for the longest, and, and bless him. It's funny how people are now calling him Snowflake, which is just blowing my mind. But Howard Stern said that the next time Aaron Rodgers gets hurt, because he said Joe, he gets his medical advice from his now good friend Joe Rogan. That the next time he hurts his ankle or his knee or his shoulder, the Packers should run Joe Rogan out on the field. Is that what he said? Sure he's okay. Yeah. Is that what he said? That's funny. I thought it was great. I missed out on it on the first half of this thing. So that's funny. We're gonna Yeah, Howard's been going after him. He went after Kyrie. He went after uh he's yeah. uh he's he, there, are, he, he, there were a lot of interesting outcomes over the weekend. Wow. One of the ones that we tend to focus on in Southern California is Chargers and Rams and what they did and didn't do. And there was something in the game that I watched when the Chargers outlasted, I guess is what you want to use, a very, very tough Eagle team. But I, there's a thing about travel in sports that people always make this big deal out of. Oh, the Chargers had to go from L.A. to go across the country from L.A. to Philadelphia. People, I want to tell you something. Football travel isn't hard. Okay, let me paint you a picture. It's one game a week. They can get there across said country any day they want to. You land. You don't land at 3 a.m. like you do as an NBA player. You don't land at 4 or 2 a.m. like you do as a baseball player, oftentimes depending on when the game ends. Football travel is easy. So the idea that it is this undertaking for the Chargers to leave Los Angeles and go play in Philadelphia, and that's what makes it a good win. I always have found that to be laughable and stupid, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, and the way the NFL schedule makes up, really, you're only making the long haul maybe a few times a year because your division maybe. halls aren't that long. You got eight home games. You're only traveling eight times anyway, and you've got a division. You know, th three of them are division games, which aren't usually long hauls Short flights. at all. Short flights, short flights. And, uh, you know, so you might make one or two. I don't buy into it a whole lot. Early in the season, maybe, first couple weeks, if you have some back-to-back -back road games in week one or two, that's just getting used to a lot of things, perhaps. But now, at this point in the season, when you're just playing, everybody's playing football. Everybody's up against yes. the same things, the bumps, the bruises, the travel. I don't want to hear about it. That, that excuse isn't washable, especially to a team that's been, you know, playing for – you know, at this long against good teams coming into their place and going on the road. And, uh, you know, so 
But I, I've said it all year, man. The Eagles are scrappy. They're the best, yeah, like, yeah. bad record in football. They really are a scrappy team. They've been scrappy. They've 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 hung around against good teams all year. Um, you know, they had Tampa in their sights even way you out know, for a little bit, and uh, you know, so. <laughs> I thought that I thought watching that game that Jalen Hurts. I like Jalen Hurts, but I understand the limitations surrounding Jalen Hurts. Mm-hmm. And not from a coaching standpoint that Nick Sirianni doesn't really know which way is up because some weeks he does, some weeks he don't. That's what you're gonna get from a rookie head coach. I thought Devontae Smith played a, played a great game. So he's got weapons, he's got guys to throw to, he's got a, he's got a couple decent backs. But I think he's good with a cap on it. I don't think he's I don't think he's a franchise quarterback. I think he's a guy who will be able to consistently perform under the right circumstances, but he will never ever be the reason you win a Super Bowl. And I think the fortune for him is that's how we portray quarterbacks. Either you can or you cannot, and there's no in-between, even though most of the league is filled with in-between guys. Like, yeah. to me, Derek Carr is an in-between guy. I like Derek Carr. I think he's a good Face for the Raiders for what they're going through. I thought he's been a very tough person to, he's been a good person to lead them through a tough situation. But you don't win a Super Bowl with Derek Carr. I I, I don't think it's going to happen. So I think, like, I think Baker Mayfield's an in between guy. Yes. Right. Perfect example. But when you do, but I will say this for a Jalen Hurts or a Derek Carr, even, and other in between guys, if you do have a Nick Chubb and you've got a Miles Garrett. And you've got some good coordinators. You've got other guys covered, and you you can own the line of scrimmage at both ends. Because you know the one thing that Browns game showed me last night again, yesterday again was, boy, it's still old fashioned football. If you really want to perform well uh, yep. consistently, it's between team. the trenches. It's being the better offense and defensive line. It's having the running back that you can that can go burst and get you the big chunks, make the big plays, get you into play action. Because when you can get into play action the way the Browns did yesterday, it can make an in between guy a whole heck of a lot hard to handle, i.e. a car, maybe a Hurts as he gets a little bit more experience. Jalen Hurts, to me, a little bit reminds me of kind of how he, I liken him to Lamar Jackson, but he, to me, he's like how Phillip Rivers was always kind of just behind Manning and behind Brady. You know what I mean? Like right, you can liken him guy. to those guys, but you just know he's not those guys. Right, Hertz has a lot of ability, and I really like him. And 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 I'd go out on the field with him over a lot of different quarterbacks, from what I've seen. And especially if I can get a Nick Chubb behind him and a Miles Garrett on the other side of the ball of him. But yeah, there's just I feel like you're you're right in a lot of ways where there's just there's a cap on him a little bit. Whereas like Lamar busted yeah. through the cap that people thought he was, and he's showing that he can get better and better at a at an accelerated rate of speed. So, but I like that. I like that scrappiness. I like Jalen Hurts. I like the way the the Eagles go after teams with with what they've got. It's it's kind of the Eagles are kind of what Dan Campbell told us the Lions would be, and, and they're not. You know, I I I think that the two things that I found to be interesting was that the Chargers' ability to just win the close ones now when they were used to be cursed and found ways to lose the close ones. That seems to now be turning it around. Um, they're ending games that they played well with victories as opposed to ending games where they played well with finding a way to lose. I thought that mm-hmm. that was interesting. And I also thought that at the end of the day, with what's happening in that division and what happened over the NFL this this particular Sunday with all the teams losing that you never would have seen losing wow. winning that game was important. Cause let's talk about a game that no one saw coming. The Titans just beaten the hell out of the Rams on Sunday night football. We, you spoke about old school football. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like when one team has an identity and this is what we do. Versus mm-hmm. another team that doesn't necessarily do that, but they they can if they have to, but they don't specialize in it. And so if you hit them hard, you can knock them down. And the Titans hit the Rams' offensive line right up the middle from go. And Matt Stafford was not the same for the rest of the game. No, you know, and uh, that was an interesting examination on 
where you can be, and, and that's where you can beat. You got to find where you can beat a good defense, right? The Rams yes. rely a lot on coming after your quarterback by putting in passing situations and then making big plays in the secondary with all the skill they got back there. And when you're running the ball between the tackles and knocking them on their butt going backwards and you're getting, you can't make big plays on defense. I mean, unless, right. you know, and it wears on you. So the strip fumbles, the, the those kind of plays. And if you, you know, if you guys are running the ball between you and knocking you over and getting you in, you know, owning the line of scrimmage at the defensive end, well, that's that's the big weakness I think we saw from the Rams is if you can go after them and run it and run it and run it, well, then that secondary can't make big plays. Aaron Donald can't make big plays, and then he gets frustrated or they get frustrated, and then penalties mount up because they're not getting to play their pace and their style, and it right. gets away from them, and they're back on the field because Stafford threw another interception or they fumbled, or you know, and, and, it, and it unraveled quickly, and Vrabel is really showing – you know, I mean, yeah, he had his little honeymoon a couple years ago going to the AFC title game, and but he's really showing that he's a top tier coach in this league with I, what he can, you know, maneuver and manufacture with guys out and with the way they do things. And um, that was an impressive football game. And as much as I hated that Aaron Donald roughing the passer late on that yeah, third down, that could have at least got the Rams the ball back. And, and the fans on TV maybe would have had a chance to see maybe a finish to a 21-9 game with some time on the clock. That just basically ended the game by giving them that. Titans still dominated that football game. I thought that what we we, we saw with the Aaron Donald call and what we've seen at least once a week around the league, there are too many rules. I can't repeat this enough. I don't know how else to say it. There are too many rules. You're asking the referee to go down his to, to have a second. By the way, a part-time referee because they're all part-time. You're asking mm -hmm. part-time referees to have a litany of memory about what's legal, what's not illegal at the drop of a hat, and they're getting it wrong more often times than they're not. And and I thought that that really did. It didn't. That's not why they lost the game, but it no. it, it left the game. It you left the game going. I didn't like that. Well, turn that the TV the off game. instead of watching it. Possibly the Ram punting right. it to the Rams and maybe Stafford finally having a possession where, you know, they, I mean, right. they got a cheap touch or whatever. But like, yeah, like then it's 28 to nine because then you hit a call another one after frustration. And then it, so that's then the only over. thing is that you turn the TV off because of these things. So the NFL needs to know that that flag made the television sets turn off or go to other channels. I, I went to succession right after that. I was just like, well, this thing, this is no reason to watch this now. Whereas people got to their Sunday night viewing when that play happened. Yeah. Literally. People went right to the DVR when that happened. What I hate about the Donald one, which is there's a lot of them around there. But if you said today, look, we're changing the rule. It's just you do, we don't even want you to tackle the quarterback. Two hands on him. Get two hands on him, and he's automatically down. That would have been a textbook play by Aaron right. Donald under those reels. He all he did was go like this. That's it. We did. I I I, I hope that again. And and the and the NFL is good about this. They're terrible at a lot of things. They're really good at looking at what sucked and make them look bad, and fixing what made them look bad. They're very good at that because they're a very intimate conscious. And so I, I think that they'll that's being. Football guys don't like to see a game be changed like that. And I think the NFL, at the end of the day, they're not ran by lawyers, even though the law a lawyer is the, is the commissioner. They're ran by football guys. I think that that part will get fixed. Around the league, we saw a lot of other crazy things. If I told you the Jaguars were going to beat the Bills, you would have laughed in my face. And then you see the score of 6-9, to nine, not in a joking way. And you go, <laughs> ew. But that was that game. A 6-9 to nine finish uh, with a, a Josh Allen, who is a great young quarterback, who people are already, uh, quote, unquote, head of their skis on, keep playing down to the competition. Yeah, I think this was one of those that it was a total overlook. And yeah. it's a week, the league's a week-to-week -week league, and it is. You know, there's bad teams in the NFL every year, sure. But in a week, but the parity of bad. I want to agree with this. In a week to week league, should the, should the Bills still win that game? Oh, of course they should. There's no doubt. The Bills, and if they lose that game, they shouldn't lose with six points. 
Um, right. You know, if they are going to lose that game, that's got to be on one of those. Why? Did you see that crazy play in the Jaguars Bills game? Right. No, I saw. No, I saw five field goals. Is what I saw. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> no, it was terrible. It was unviewable. It was unwatchable. It was horrendous. Is what it was. So, what, um, who had the it, who had the more surprising turnout on Sunday? What happened between the Broncos and the Cowboys, or what happened between Jacksonville and Buffalo? I think the Broncos and Cowboys, because I think mm. Jacksonville at least has that rookie QB. There's at least a lot of still positivity in the locker room. Look, guys, we're young. Hey, look, you know, da 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 da. You know, let's just and we got the number one pick. And there's there's re, you know, I mean, the Broncos just traded Von Miller. They just traded their best defensive player in the history of the, in the franchise, and they look like they've already quit. Whereas, yeah, Jacksonville was bad out of the gate, and they've been bad, but they've tried to win football games. Denver right. almost looked like they have quit for a couple of weeks. And then the Von Miller trade, and you're looking at all these Cowboys at home, uh, you know, the, the weapons that they have uh, you know, against that Bronco team. And for them to just come out and just be just that flaccid all day, it wasn't one of those things where it was just like, eh, they got by behind too far. And it was like, no, I mean, those even those last two touchdowns, those were just cheap garbage. I mean that was just yes. terrible. Yes, those are stat padding touchdowns. Those are just those are just Denver saying run the clock all you want. I, we're just trying to right. get out of here now. We're just trying. Not, I thought we're not, we don't want to get anybody on the defense hurt. We just traded our best player in the history of the franchise. I th I thought people made a lot out of the Raiders losing to the Giants. I, I think the Giants have been playing well. They've just they haven't been successful at the end of the game, and I felt like they found a way to do that in this game. I felt like a lot of people were very. Um, I don't even know how to categorize the Saints and the and the Falcons, but you were starting your second string quarterback. Well, quite possibly your third string quarterback. Right. And Atlanta started all their players and they just they beat you. They beat you. So I those were the two games that I saw those scores. And I went, oh hell. That can't be right. I <laughs> when it was a sixth uh, I don't know when I tuned in, but I tuned in because I have the NFL Sunday ticket. I tuned in to the Jacksonville game. It's like, oh, well, at least let me look at Trevor Lawrence. Let me see what he looks like. I didn't see him. And I saw the, the Bills had six points. It was like the early third quarter. I was like, what the hell? This game's drunk. Yeah. Well, little did I know. That was, the, that was the start of a crazy upside down weekend. Yeah, and it's just is uh, those happen in the NFL. They've been known to happen over the course of years. You always get one or two of those weeks where you know the head just goes all the way around in a circle like the cartoon. Like, what was right. that? Um, and even the Browns Bengals. You know, I mean, with what the Browns went through in that kind of adversity game and the way the Bengals have played up. The Bengals were five and three, and they had three losses by a total of nine points. Only nine points. Three points to everybody they lost to. They and so the, for them to get beat that way, not just beat by the Browns. That's fine. A lot of people. That's not a surprise. But forty-one to sixteen, and the way the Browns just shifted into overdrive. Um, but I, I disagree with you. I disagree. I wasn't shocked by that. And it's not because my belief about Joe Burrow. Right. I felt well, like I'm not putting it into the classifications of the two we were just talking about, but I'm just saying even that with that score and outcome was a little bit more like, wow. Anything. Can I thought we were going to see that type of game from the Browns. Here's why. When Odell Beckham Jr. doesn't play for whatever reason, the Browns coaching staff and their play calling is drastically different. So I don't know who was more spooked by the presence of Odell. Was it the play caller? Was it the head coach? Or was it the quarterback? But I do know when he's not out there, they run the ball like hell. They're probably the best running team when he's not around in the league. And I'm talking about over Tennessee. I'm talking about over yeah. Baltimore. I you cannot stop them from running the ball when Odell Beckham's not on the field. So what Baker Mayfield did was pedestrian. Like any a Jets quarterback could have done that. But look at what they did run the ball with Nick Chubb. Where has that been? What where's that been with Odell? And though well, I, I think been, this, Yeah, it hasn't been in the play calling scheme. It, it, right. You're right. So for, 
for some reason, when he's not around, the coaching staff goes, okay, well, like, we don't – now, I don't know. I don't even know if it's a we don't trust Baker thing. I think they are, the coaching staff is more comfortable being a run-first, run-heavy team than they are letting Beckham uh, – Beckham, letting uh, Mayfield pass the ball 40 times. I don't think they want to do that. But when Odell's out, they're like, damn, we got Odell, we got Jarvis, we got Njoku, and we got these backs. We got to get, we got to put the ball in Baker's hands and let him do what he can do. But now Odell's out. Like, well, hell no. We ain't giving it to Baker. Hand that ball off. Well, right. And you get to go to the, like you said, less, less th- reasons to throw, especially on early downs, right? We don't yep. have to force things into, into first and second down throws. We get to go double tight end sometimes more yep. because we want to run the ball more and get both tight ends out on the floor where Baker's more successful with his tight ends than his wide receivers. It's not just Odell. I mean, Baker gets makes a living off of throwing when Hunt's in the game. He gets a makes a living off of throwing to Hunt and the tight ends tight end. more than all of his wide receivers, not just Odell. Jarvis has been the end zone Jones this was like, year. Where the hell has that been? Yeah, and you get to go, and then when you're running on early downs and getting chunks of yardage, you get into play action more. And so I think that we've we we saw more play action. So it's easy, right? Right, run the ball, uh, average north of six yards a carry, uh, protect your quarterback, which this offensive line has been able to do for the most part, unless we're play calling bad and putting ourselves in a lot of throwing situations. And, and Baker holds mm-hmm. on too long. I think most of the sacks Baker's taken, he'd even say were probably his fault and just the offense in general, uh, the way it was uh, schemed for that play. But now you get an offensive line that wants to push for it. They want to run the ball, right? We want to, we want to yes. knock these guys over because we know Chubb's going to, you know, there, one game, everybody talked about Chubb's 70 yard run yesterday and it was, it was unbelievable, right? The way he just coasted past the secondary that had 10, 15 yards on him and the angle. But what I loved was there was a play where he took a handoff. He got knocked back for on first down. He got knocked back for a two yard loss. They made it second and 12. We went right back to him and he picked up 13 and a first down. I mean, that's the kind of football this team has to play. And that kind of football doesn't fit Odell into the equation. You know what fits into the equation here? Us coming back tomorrow. Brown and Lawhead. Tomorrow, six o'clock. Go Bears. Go Bears.